As it had been in the years before the Great War, Big Mountain, the Big Empty, became home to one of the brightest minds of the 23rd century. The Courier watched over the Big Empty for years to come, caring for it and keeping its discoveries safe until they were needed to help others. Which had always been Big Mountain's purpose. Past the laboratories and science, it had always been intended as a place to build the future of all mankind. The Courier had scoured much of the Big Empty, although secrets still remained in the crater's depths. Perhaps that was for the best, however. Curiosity, while sometimes rewarded for its efforts, often proves to be equally dangerous. The Forbidden Zone continued to be, true to its name, Forbidden. No more robo-scorpions were sighted in its canyons. Big Mountain became even emptier, devoid of Dr. Mobius's proclamations forecasting the destruction of anything that dared possess sentience. Still, it is said he lived on in the equations inscribed on the floor and walls of the Forbidden Zone Dome. A cobweb tracery of symbols that told of a thousand brilliant thoughts, now lost to time. The sink atop the dome bustled with the voices of a small town, constantly chirping, arguing, and snarling at each other. Still, this all happened productively in the interests of its new owner. The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit discovered, despite its inversion code, it was comforted by the sense of community the other personalities gave it. The biological research station, obsessed with seeding everything in sight, requested a transfer to the X-22 Botanical Garden, so that it might, in its own words, sensually fertilize the garden's smooth contours. The garden sent back a polite refusal, saying it had prior commitments with a vault it had helped infect before the war. The book shoot continued to devour all seditious materials until it nearly choked on a paperclip. It adamantly maintained it was a Chinese paperclip, and the whole thing had been an elaborately orchestrated assassination attempt. Whatever the reason, it slowed down for a while, carefully appraising each document and clipboard that came to it. The light switches continued to bicker and flicker. This persisted until the day someone dropped a flashlight in the sink, and the two of them united in their hatred of the showboat. The sink continued to ruthlessly scrub any particulate matter that came near it. Eventually, it gained access to the magnetohydraulics plant and nearly flooded all the big empty in an attempt to scrub the crater clean. Once it learned of the innovative toxins plant, however, it gained new purpose. It sought to develop antitoxins to flush into its drains and counteract the poisons bleeding into the soil. The toaster continued its psychotic spree reducing all appliances in range to scrap electronics and spare parts. After one of its more psychotic episodes, however, the other sink personalities decided enough was enough and dumped the toaster in a bathtub. Sparking and hissing, the toaster swore its enemies would rue the day when they had bread and no way to toast it. Muggy did his best to collect coffee cups, although in his quest, he accidentally trapped himself in Higgs Village. It might have been the end for poor Money. Except he found it peaceful there, tidying up the kitchens of the think tank professors back when they had been flesh and bone. Well, except for Dr. O, who was an asshole for having created Muggy in the first place. Muggy left O's house deliberately dirty, punishing the dishes and cups that lived there in blind revenge for serving Dr. O. Blind Owl Jefferson, with sounds the courier brought him, created a symphonic counterfrequency that saved Big Mountain from sonic invasion in 2910. 
If you didn't hear about it, good. It was rumored by the other personalities that he had a brief fling with the light switches. Although he forgot their names once too often and was soon left in the dark as punishment. Autodoc, always gentle and methodical, kept sewing up the courier in all the right places when the skin split open from repeated wear and tear. The Autodoc was just glad to have purpose again. It heard its simpler brothers and sisters who got shipped to the Sierra Madre bored out of their skulls in that toxic dead city. In time, the Autodoc found a way to deactivate the Y-17 trauma harnesses, releasing the corpses they had held prisoner for almost 200 years. As the courier made his way through the X-8 facility, the computers analyzed the test subject's movements. They eventually created new cyber dogs to root out commie traitors from the wasteland. Traitors like Betsy Bright, Richie Marcus. Although they couldn't seem to find any commies, so they turned on themselves, howling sonic barks that echoed miles across the landscape. The infiltration program in X-13 felt spent, having repeatedly upgraded the stealth suit until it could upgrade it no more. It felt warm, fulfilled, and a bit sluggish. It realized not long after, the stealth suit had left it without so much as a note on the nightstand. So the infiltration program sent out robo-brains into the wastes, looking for its wayward technology. It eventually found Repcon HQ and set up a new research center, testing and murdering fiends who kept breaking into the facility. The courier left the brain at the big empty. A strange thing to say, but it was the truth. Brains are less important than they may seem. When the courier's body finally passed, the brain was saddened. It kept on, remembering the vessel that had once contained it. Even at the end, when it started to fail, however, the brain resisted going into a floating chassis like the think tank. It never said why. Perhaps it was out of respect for the courier's body. All things must come to an end. And to hang on to the past is something that's not to be undertaken lightly. The think tank basement, filled with lobotomized robotical frames of the doctors, now served as a graveyard. The monitors had recorded the battle in its entirety, including the think tank's final shrill, terrified screams, whimpers, and pleas for mercy. They broadcast these humiliating last moments as a warning to anyone approaching the perimeter that other smarty pants were not welcome. The courier was the inheritor of the big empty, and there was room for only one will in the halls of the think tank dome. There is an expression in the wasteland, old world blues. It refers to those so obsessed with the past, they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. They stare into the what was, eyes like pilot lights, guttering and spent, as the realities of their world continue on around them. Science is a long, steady progression into the future. What may seem a sudden event often isn't felt for years, even centuries to come. In the times following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, however, Old World Blues took on a new meaning. Where once it was viewed as a form of sadness, nostalgia, it became an expression describing the potential for the future. It can be easy to see science as evil, technology unchecked as the source of all ills, all misfortunes. With the courier at the helm, Science became a beacon for the future. There was old world blues, and new world hope. And hope ruled the day at Big Mountain. We could say more, but the stories in the Big Empty speak for themselves. Now armed with the transportal ponder, the courier could return to the dome at any time and crack open the secrets of the Big Empty one by one. The sink sat vigilant, waiting for its master to return. 
shoes covered in Mojave dust. Only one road yet remained, and it was one the courier had to walk alone. Oh, transport all ponder. Woo! Oh. Hey, we can go and come back. Uh, pull the trigger and away I'll go. That's pretty cool. It's totally incapable of harming you right now. Oh. Huh. <laughs> hey, good to see you guys too. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Eh? Oh, it's him. Dude. Dude. Hey. Hey. Are you drunk? Dude. Hey. Oh, it doesn't work in here. It's done. Alright. Dude, shut the fuck up. Dude. Thank you.